<laughs> this year I'm not presenting anything. Uh, every year for a uh, I do. <laughs> I did that once, and then I got my own. Uh, so that's easy. Today I'm going to uh, use this opportunity to uh, present something that uh, uh, we won't show otherwise, uh, a historical perspective of why we got there. And uh, you can see that uh, on, this, uh, on this line, it goes back to 1997, the book, the as the spark uh, uh, has been uh, going from uh, uh, team to team, uh, so evolving uh, the uh, project leader for the different, uh, for each of these books, I believe, uh, and we end up with a, a small library of books in park, well, maybe a, a tenth of a shelf, uh, and it's not finished. So uh, maybe one day we have a spark for them. Mm -hmm. or maybe. Uh, something else I want to touch on is that something more recent that uh, we see uh, interesting uh, fast projects that use Spark. And so we want to encourage this, of course. Uh, so I'll talk about those that uh, uh, are particularly noticeable. Not so going back to the history of Spark, uh, it started a long time ago, more than 30 years now, 1987. Uh, the company uh, with a great name, Program Validation Limited. Uh, so they had this goal of indeed uh, uh, doing uh, uh, giving warranties on programs that you can run so that uh, you don't end up uh, with a failure that you have uh, So this company went uh, through various uh, renamings and uh, acquisitions. It was Praxis during a long time. Now it's Alpha. Uh, and this, this long time, they, they had uh, great projects. So one of the first the really big was this C-130J, uh, which is a, a big military plane. And the mission, uh, com the mission com computer uh, application was done in Spark. Uh, they had also a security, so that's more on the safety realm. They had uh, a security project like Token Year, which was a project done by Altran for the NSA in 2005. And we'll talk about it a bit later because in 2008, uh, this project was open source. Because of this, because of this event, so Altran partners with Aircor. Uh, and we convinced them that there was uh, some value in uh, pushing the technology forward in open source. So it's been uh, GPL since then. Uh, so this, the, the past history I won't cover much today. Uh, if you are interested, there's this uh, article by Roy Chapman and Florian Shanda uh, by, that really covered this, uh, this period. So a number of things uh, evolved. And 2008, we started something new. So we started this project, Highlights. Uh, the small tagline is simplifying the use of formal methods. Uh, and what we ended up doing in this project is rebuild the world thing. So uh, uh, we uh, scrapped the previous technology, kept the good ideas, and uh, we did it. 
And the result was this uh, Spark 2014 language and so uh, In between, so while we were rebuilding the technology, uh, projects were still uh, being done. So two uh, uh, noticeable projects are the IFAX project. So IFAX is uh, part of the uh, air traffic control over the UK. So when you uh, uh, travel to the UK, uh, usually by flight, when you use the shuttle, you using this software, which helps uh, air traffic controllers to foresee possible collisions, uh, drive the, the decision making in, in, in asking planes to, uh, to do uh, uh, some actions to avoid collisions. Uh, and uh, uh, in 2013, uh, the main the separation kernel, the first version was issued, and we'll talk a bit more about this because uh, this one is open source. An interesting fact is that these two uh, were initially uh, coded with the previous version of Spark, obviously, and uh, in the past years, uh, they have both migrated to uh, Spark 2014. So uh, you may say, well, migration, is it, isn't it a big word for uh, uh, going for, from a subset of data to a subset of data? Uh, because it's precisely not uh, as legal as a subset of data. Please. Yes. You're so sorry. Mm -hmm. So let's see an example. So this was a uh, previous version of Spark. So it's not a subset of data. It's, it was presented uh, in those days as really a different language. Uh, so it was, uh, it was heretic to say that it was a subset of data. It was using a subset of data as the operational code uh, on which it was imprinting a logical annotations, logical language. There were two languages in one. And so, for example, here you can see an API um, about computations and price of something with something like, that looks like the post conditions that Jack uh, just uh, mentioned that says that when add returns, and it, re it must return something, uh, this sum which has some properties, uh, same for melt, and, and then this one returns this exact value, etc. And you can see that already the, there was some rich uh, expressions, like these quantified expressions that you, you can see in mathematics to quantify your collection. Uh, you had that in, in this language. But that was a purely logical language without relationship to uh, what's executing in the machine. So only for uh, consumption by the, the analysis system. So we transformed it into that. So maybe at the first loop, that doesn't look so different from what you had before. Maybe a bit of syntax for uh, In fact, so all these things now uh, are part of the language. So that's uh, executable, that's really code code that expresses properties. So, that, so we really uh, tie to what was just presented before. Uh, these, these are the post conditions that uh, were mentioned by Jacob uh, before, uh, using richer properties, uh, like quantified expressions here. And these are additions that we felt mm, were needed in Spark, and so uh, are not yet uh, in, uh, in ADA, and we are pushing so that they are included in the version of ADA. So here, for example, these contract cases, why do we think we need major contract? Because they are allowed to specify pre-posts by cases. And it's very common to have uh, services, functionalities that behave differently depending on, on the inputs, uh, inputs or yeah, sets of inputs that are given. So for example, here, add, uh, it's a saturating addition. So if the, the result is less than a given threshold, the result will really be the addition. Otherwise, if the uh, result the expected result would be greater than the threshold, then uh, it saturates. So these contract cases have, have this semantics that they divide input, and, uh, and this can be checked either uh, statically or mm -hmm. So I'm just showing it here with a really the nicer uh, display of symbols uh, when you have a, a ligature in, uh, in your monospace fonts. Uh, uh, some of my colleagues hate it, but I take this occasion to advocate. I find, I find it cool. And, it's really nice to uh, uh, display uh, properties that uh, makes it m easier to understand. I think. So what we built during the Silent project is this uh, ecosystem of uh, open source tools. So we built our own ecosystem based on uh, building blocks. So AlterGo, CVC4, Z3, Coq, Isabel, all, all of these are automatic provers here. So take formulas, say true, false, I don't know. 
uh, uh, interactive proofs here, so they ask you for inputs and uh, help you work out the proof yourself. And all of these have uh, communities. So some, uh, some of these, you know, Coq, for example, has a huge community, dozens and dozens of research institutes. Uh, those that are most interest to us are, are these, the automatic provers. And uh, uh, Y3 is this orchestrator of, uh, of proving technology. <coughs> Uh, so what we've done with this project is really go from ERA programs to this intermediate Y3 code. So Y3 is our intermediate language, so what we call an intermediate verification language. It's the assembly language for uh, doing this kind of uh, deep analysis of code that will prove deductive verification. Uh, and uh, uh, from Y3, there's something called the VC generator, so verification condition generator, or I'll use the term, simple term uh, formula. That is from some code that represents the code here is going to generate mathematical coordinates for this code. And uh, uh, we have a shared lab which is called Continuous between uh, us and Inria, which develops uh, this part. So we, we co-develop Spark and Y3 uh, so, they have, so that they have a really, really great integration to go uh, further than what we could do. Um, yeah, so this. Uh, all this, in fact, is for the proof analysis that uh, Spark does. Uh, there's a, there are two analyses, in fact, that we do. There's uh, proof, and there's flow analysis. Flow analysis is something simpler that uh, checks all the flows in the program. And this is done at this level, really, at the, the level of this net proof tool. So uh, this is detecting the, the harder, or usually more complex uh, task, which is to go through proof. So in two slides, I'm going to present now uh, what we do with flow analysis and proof, because like I said, it's not a technical talk, uh, but just so that you have an idea uh, of what it does. So flow analysis does that. Uh, here is a signature of a service in ADA. Uh, and now you can uh, add to it with the ADA2012 syntax some aspects. Uh, after with, and uh, this aspect global is an aspect introduced for Spark. So uh, the tools that work with Spark understand it. The map compilers understand it uh, to some degree. Uh, and here we are completing the, uh, the signature of stabilize with the global variables that are accessed by this uh, service. So here it has additional inputs that are not passed by, by parameter. Uh, and it has an initial uh, variable rotors. Uh, it might be more than one variable, it might be a name that uh, references various variables in fact, uh, which is uh, partially read, read or written. And uh, uh, once you've, you've done that, specifying fx that you want the, uh, the function to, uh, to respect, then the tool can do this flow analysis and check that the program implements this specification. So that's the explicit specification. You might have also implicit specifications, namely in terms of flows that um, everything that you compute serves a purpose, so otherwise you will get a warning. Well, you're not doing much here. Uh, usually that's a mistake, a typo. Uh, or that uh, everything that you read is initialized. This typically is It checks both explicit and uh, implicit specification. So that's for flow analysis. And the second one is proof. So proof using the, the same uh, signature for stabilized. We can now uh, specify functional behavior, what it expects an entry. So there's all this precondition that the mode uh, in entry shouldn't be off. And can specify post conditions. So here is the uh, if expressions, the latest addition to that one. Well, that's e in the case of success, then there should be a relationship between the old value of returns and the, the new value. And of course, the previous contract and the, this contract would be uh, added together. So we are just focusing on one at a time. Uh, once these uh, specifications are added to the code, uh, the proof tool can check that the program implements this specification. So this is for the explicit functional specification, uh, but there are uh, uh, implicit ones, namely that there are no runtime errors in the code. So all uh, access, uh, access, error accesses are within bounds, uh, all uh, arithmetic is also within bounds, respects the, the rank checks of AI, etc. So to talk a bit about uh, uh, how we got to the current uh, solutions, technical solutions, uh, uh, I chose to present to you in terms of objectives that we had for this uh, revamp of the Spark technology. And so we had really high level goals, uh, not technical ones like uh, let's use this technology, it's better than this. So we had some of these. 
uh, but the high level goals were these. Um, first, functional contracts can be executed, tested, debugged, uh, because we want them to be considered as like code. So uh, we don't want to wait for, for more proof of these to, uh, to be useful. We want them to be uh, replace uh, less precise uh, uh, comments uh, and uh, specifications in natural language of code. We want them to be able to replace some of the testing articles that you would have otherwise in the separate artifacts and the code. So, uh, yeah, so that was uh, one of the main things which completely related to uh, what uh, the changes that were going uh, on in ADA at the, at the time, which was this addition of contracts of our response in the ADA language. The ADA subset supported in Spark should be as large as possible, indeed. The main reason not to use the technology because it doesn't apply in your uh, case, or definitely uh, people who do C will be able to use uh, anything that will do. We would like people who use AI to, uh, to be able to use uh, this kind of tooling as much as possible. So that was, that was I'll, I'll go into more detail, but that was a big change. Uh, user needs no annotation to start proving code. So there are various levels that I uh, which you can say proving code. I'm, I'm using it here in a large sense, so giving warranties on the code, whether it's by flow analysis or by proof. Uh, and in the booklet that uh, you will find here, um, uh, that uh, was on the far side on the right in my uh, first slide. The booklet that we wrote with Thales, we have defined five levels of uh, uh, different analysis of uh, uh, proof uh, uh, achievements that you can reach. And so uh, at the lowest level, you shouldn't have to, to work too much. Uh, you should be able to just, yeah, have, to have, uh, have a program that feels fits into the subject and starts by the uh, This one is that. You might want to go further than that at some point, uh, but you want few annotations to fully prove the code. Uh, well, we'll see what few means. What, what we want really here is that it's not super hard to uh, get beyond the initial steps. Uh, the last one, uh, we'll also need a bit uh, of background, is manual proof is something really hard that people uh, really uh, usually don't to want to do, unless you're a proof geek. Uh, so uh, we want manual proof uh, to be in that required. So looking at, at these, uh, each one of these in, in more details, we want contract to be executed, tested, and debugged. Um, so of course that's using the ADA 24 preconditions and post-conditions. If you were here in the previous talk, you know all about them. Uh, so that's this aspect pre and post. So really, our view now is that contracts are code. We can do as, as well with contracts as we could in terms of, of usability, integration in ID, etc. You can do probably as, as bad as in code, uh, calling functions with the craziest things. Uh, Spark helps you here in that respect because it's, uh, uh, it's more restrictive in what it allows. But that needed uh, some additions to ADA, so we were very uh, pushy uh, with the ARG so that they include in ADA 2012 some of the features which we really needed for proof. So quantified expression, so the, the ability to state properties of a collection, uh, expression functions, the ability to abstract properties so that you don't have to inline everything each time or have to go to the body to state something that you would need in the spec, it would be crazy and would be completely contrary to uh, this uh, spirit of separating the spec and the body in particular, when you want to read to specify rich properties, not just bounds or, or things that you would inline. So, so for these two, uh, yeah, we, we uh, I don't know if we bribed, but uh, we pushed enough the ARG, and particularly our colleague that had a core uh, member of the, of the ARG, so that this, these two features were part of the ADA uh, standard. The fact that the ADA subset is large, uh, there was a departure from the previous technology. Previous technology adds this correct by construction motto that uh, if you followed a certain steps and restrictions, it was far easier to verify formally uh, your program. This is true. Uh, unfortunately, that's very rare that uh, you can follow uh, all these uh, constraints uh, from the start. Uh, you have to be in a, a, a rich, nice situation where you start over and do everything as you were told from the start. Uh, and uh, you might need then to completely change your ways of doing things, so that, that's really a big constraint. 
So we, we opted for something different. Uh, we say it's all these constraints, they're going to be a new kind standard. Uh, so there are other tools. Uh, we are developing some of them, but there are other tools. Uh, we're going to opt for every feature that uh, doesn't make formal verification impossible. So we included almost everything. What we still exclude to, to this day are pointers and exceptions. All the rest is it. So in particular, all types, uh, discriminant types, types with dynamic bounds, uh, anything can take off. Uh, restriction, no, no restriction on control flow. So you can return from within the loop anywhere. You can uh, have a complex uh, hierarchy of packages. That's not our business, so we know how to make sense of the code. This is a separate issue. Uh, recursion. Uh, again, in many embedded uh, situations, you want recursion. In some, uh, non-embedded or others, you might. And, and that's okay because we can make sense of it. Generics. Uh, there was an attempt at uh, supporting generics in uh, the previous version of ADA, uh, which was quite limited because uh, the attempt was to uh, check generics once and for all. We wanted to allow any generics uh, that the ADA language would allow, so we opted for something much simpler, which is to analyze each instance. So, uh, we, we support generics, but in a way uh, that may be less principled than before, but much more permissive and, and allows more code to be analyzed. So for all these uh, features, so all types, no restriction on control for recursion in particular, these in fact are, there are good reasons why they were not supported before. There are good reasons why they were not supported before. Uh, they uh, can be quite uh, uh, difficult to, to treat in proof. Uh, and uh, and when, when we uh, implemented these, we ended up with subtle bugs along the years in the, in the treatments of uh, types with dynamic bounds, in particular uh, co complex control flow, uh, uh, recursion, Com uh, really uh, uh, subtle bugs in uh, how we generate the formulas and, uh, and which ended up in uh, possible unsoundness in the tool. Uh, so uh, we believe today that <laughs> uh, we have had good, good fixes for these bugs, uh, but that's, that's one of the reasons why, uh, uh, yeah, ideally you want the program to be as simple as possible. Uh, we made this choice to uh, allow as much as we could do uh, uh, and to focus on soundness. So of course, uh, each one of these, these few bugs that I mentioned were treated very, very carefully to, uh, to be sure that today uh, we don't have them or anything that uh, uh, Still, the initial version of Squad 2014 uh, did not support a number of things. So we felt we had done a big jump here. Uh, some people uh, we were saying, well, you don't support OO, you don't support concurrency, tasks, config uh, object, you don't support data endurance that were just add, had been added to AI 2012. So the, the sad thing as well is that while we were doing a big jump over this, we were uh, going a bit backward on OO and concurrency because the previous version of Spark was supporting slightly OO, so no dispatching calls, but type types, so well, not really OO, but uh, a bit of type types. I was supporting some concurrency, so it was called the Raven's Park, uh, so restrictions of a Raven's car for five point up. But we opted for, uh, yeah, let's, let's get the tool set out and, uh, and we'll uh, have a roadmap to add these as time goes by. Uh, something else is that score code from, from the start, after a, a few experiments where uh, we were looking at a solution to mix ADA and, and, and uh, Spark code, we opted for something uh, quite fine grain uh, and at the same time uh, prescribed by the user. So you, the user can say exactly uh, in their code where uh, the Sparkle lives, so that the, the tool can, uh, can analyze just this code and not the other. So that, that's quite possible to mix things that are supported with other exceptions on the other side. So the ADA subset is still expanding. Uh, so we have added uh, along the years OO programming, uh, including dispatching calls. And for this, we use the, the best that uh, uh, academia has, has shown it's possible to do, which is to show that uh, derived classes uh, are providing subset of behaviors of the parent classes. So that's called, the long name is Liskov Substitution Principle. Uh, for example, that has, that's one of the means to comply with OO in avionics context now. So the DO178, 
I mean standard, allows for that, and there's a special supplement to allow for OO that uh, mentions that uh, this cost substitution principle should be, should be uh, verified. By testing, by people, it should be verified. Um, so uh, essentially, that's, that's a proof thing. It has impact on closest in proof. But on the proof thing, it means that when you derive uh, a function, a subprogram, uh, your uh, precondition will, will be possibly weaker, so you will uh, uh, accept to be called in, in, in more context than, uh, than the thing you derive from. Uh, but your post condition will be only stronger, so you will deliver more possibly to the, to the color because you might be called through uh, a dispatching call with the uh, with static type that, that is uh, one of your factors. So that makes the, the kind of analysis that we're doing here function by function possible. We added support for concurrency the year, one year later. Uh, so again, using what had been done in previous technology, so we support Raven's, Raven's car, really, uh, almost all of Raven's car. Even the extended Raven's car profile that has been de defined uh, one or two years ago. And uh, contrary to the previous technology, uh, we insisted on not having a host uh, of uh, annotations that you need to put in the code. So it's mostly uh, generative, uh, all the things that are accessed by whom, by where, by, the, by which tasks, how to detect the uh, data races. Uh, much less annotation, much less uh, user work, but it means also it's, it's less modular. So it really builds on uh, the full program to really detect all possible uh, uh, data races. Support for type predicates, type invariants. Uh, so I won't go into much detail, but there are two types of uh, data invariants in ALA, and we now support both. Uh, for why uh, we had to do it uh, uh, one by one? Uh, because in fact, ADA is uh, defining what this means to be a type predicate or type invariant dynamically, which means that it checks at some points in the execution that uh, some properties are verified. This is not enough for proof. Uh, type predicates, these are the, th the things that should always hold, so what they call strong invariants in academia. And type invariants, uh, there are the things that should hold outside of the defining package, uh, what they are called weak invariants means that they are uh, less good than the strong invariant. It just means that sometimes you, you are allowed to break them when you define operations over your object. And to be able to prove them, you have to be much stricter and much more low. So you don't allow these to mention uh, any global variable uh, that anyone can, uh, can modify. Uh, you, uh, you have to uh, be able to assume them, for example, when you enter a package that uh, is responsible for an object. Uh, and how to enforce that really these guarantees are strong always hold when they, they should hold. And so that, that we had to uh, define stronger rules in uh, Spark reference manuals that uh, we could uh, implement in, in proof and proof. And finally, an ex exciting one the, on which we are working now is the support for ownership, ownership access types in uh, ADA and Spark. Uh, so ADA has a really rich uh, access types so of pointers uh, which prevent a number of problems. Uh, one which is not granted and it's uh, explicit when you do an uh, unchecked deallocation, there's the unchecked thing that uh, uh, can worry you, uh, is uh, yeah, automatic safe deallocation management of memory. <coughs> and uh, it's something that other languages like Rust have solved uh, for a number of programs by using this uh, notion of ownership, uh, where a pointer really holds, the, uh, really uh, uh, owns everything that uh, the tree of uh, memory that, uh, that is underneath with mechanisms to borrow this, uh, this ownership when you're doing a, a temporary uh, modification to a program. And so uh, we have uh, experimented with that last year in the context of, uh, of uh, GLATS. Uh, we even have a prototype. Uh, we are, last, last week we uh, sent uh, submissions uh, to uh, uh, the CAV uh, uh, scientific conference for the, the underlying uh, scientific mechanisms and to ADA Europe for the uh, proposal for the future ADA standard. Uh, you can also read the uh, ADA issue 2040 if you are if you want to be a bit language lawyery. Uh, so so that's that's the thing that's cooking for I would say the next two years because uh, let's not be too ambitious. Uh, uh, the rules will be will take time to really uh, be defined for ADA uh, and in part in, in combination. So that's a great example where 
Ada and Spark are moving in the same directions, although we, we will certainly have a slightly different answer for Spark, which is probably is stricter than, than, than the Okay, so uh, users are lazy. I mean, we are users. So <laughs> uh, we want uh, to have all results without them doing any work. And uh, in particular, when we start, uh, when we want to try out, uh, we'd rather just yeah, see what what good is it for us uh, before we invest any more uh, work. That's why it was important that we can we can start doing this analysis, this proof um, without further use. So every superam signature, in fact, it has a precondition and, and a postcondition, which is implicit in its uh, signature. That uh, all inputs of uh, the program are in their types, and when you return, all outputs are in their type. Uh, there are some consequences in terms of what you initialize, of course. So uh, Spark is a bit stricter than Ada uh, in that respect, that when you're passing things around, they have to be fully initialized in the types. Uh, but that gives a, a really reasonable the default functional program. Then you need to know what are, I mean, inputs and outputs, what are these? There are parameters, so that's easy, they are in the signature, uh, and global variables. Might be really yeah, uh, global in terms of having the lifetime of the program, or uh, 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 syntactically scopes uh, at uh, an outer uh, scope. And so these, what we call these global variables, that are read and, and written by uh, any given subprogram directly, indirectly to calls, they are generated by Google. So uh, here again, this analysis necessarily is, is not modular. Uh, it goes through the call graph and collects all effects so that you don't have to do this work uh, yourself. Now, uh, when you would want to go beyond, so you're, you're satisfied with the tool, uh, you want to uh, achieve more, uh, you have to start doing some work, unfortunately. Uh, but what we claim now is that you can, you need few or fewer annotations, because uh, few is uh, quite relative to where you start from. Uh, few for uh, many uh, would, would mean no, uh, no, no annotation, that's not possible, and again, it depends where you put the, 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 the goal. So if you aim for something easy, you will need uh, less work. If you aim for, for something harder, more guaranteed, you will need to, to work more. So yeah, proof, as I said, uh, is mostly modular. So we, we will analyze using the very uh, complex tools, uh, very uh, rich SMT solvers, sub-program by sub-program, which means that to analyze calls, we will need whatever information you give us, precondition, post-conditions in particular. Uh, in some cases, we can do without because we have inlining mechanisms. So internal programs that have no contracts, uh, the tool uh, inlines them. Uh, some, some loops, so what we call the simple for loops, uh, we, we just enroll them. So that you don't have to add uh, the necessary annotations in simple cases. Uh, and things that, that uh, do not participate in the API. The API is really the specification, the things internal, we'd like to, to strip uh, all of them if possible and, and try to, to go in this direction. You can factorize annotations, so for example, uh, data invariance. That was really important to add, to add support for these uh, type predicates, type invariance, because not putting them means that you, you should uh, specify them for every pre, post, everywhere where you manipulate some of these data. So that, that's really important factorization here. Uh, and now a lot also of this, uh, of these benefits has to do with how we now generate formulas. So that's, I'm going to that, but that's the technology behind it, the fact that we completely replace the technology using state of the art. Uh, and now this generation of formulas, you need much fewer loop invariants, special kind of annotations needed for, for loops sometimes. You don't need cut points, so ways to uh, simplify the, the, the proof work. So just to show it in practice, uh, an example where you really need fewer annotations. Spark skin, uh, that was a container for SHA3, uh, and uh, there was a, sta uh, a standard uh, C implementation of that algorithm. Uh, and uh, Rod Chapman, who was at the time a leader of the Spark team at uh, Altran, uh, create, wrote the uh, Spark implementation of that. So uh, the Spark implementation, uh, so there's a, there's a scientific article about it. And the Spark implementation requires a lot of work. So you had uh, many annotations for effects and dependencies. So the global I mentioned and depends on the one for dependencies between inputs and outputs. There were many preconditions and postconditions. So I, I don't count here just 
a precondition because a precondition could be tens of uh, lines of code. Uh, so I count conditions, the things that you end together, because there are new conditions that you want to check. And there were a lot of conditions in open learners as well, around loops. There were a number of annotations to just do with the limitations of the tool in terms of scalability. And even with that, uh, you have to complete a number of proof manual. Okay. So that was a huge effort for someone, a uh, really a worldwide expert in the technology who has led the development for some effort at least uh, to, to prove absence of runtime errors on this code. That's the situation today. Uh, so today with the current technology, it's really uh, uh, achievable by anyone. Uh, and that's, that's related to what I mentioned before. So, uh, to end up with this uh, part, manual proof. So you don't want to read that, that's why it's so small. <laughs> uh, on the left, you have a formula that was generated by the previous tool that it couldn't prove. And so there was, there's an encoding of your of a, a trace in your program, of a static uh, path in your code. Uh, and these uh, H1, H2 correspond to assignments, calls, various things that uh, occur on this path with an encoding of all the ADA types. And you want to, uh, to prove this conclusion that might correspond to a post condition or a runtime error. Well, uh, when the automatic provers of the time did, didn't do, you had to go through manual proof possibly. So this is a manual script where you have a number of instructions do this, infer that by this rule, unwrap this, instantiate that. Etc. Ma manipulating this uh, this uh, formula. So this we won't do, <laughs> at least not uh, in this shape, because uh, these formulas are really far from the code. Yeah, no. This is different language. This is yet another language. Obviously, there's a lot of languages, uh, so required too much effort for the typical projects. Uh, even those having a really critical and secure application. And so what uh, we do now is that uh, we target automatic progress. So we have uh, support for, uh, with the uh, state-of-the-art SMT solvers, Altergo, CBC4, Z3, and the, the whole platform really targets all of these with uh, uh, adaptations to the formulas. And these really handle well arithmetic and quantified properties that arise from your code, the, the natural encoding. Uh, the encoding that we do, uh, ex uh, apart from this specialization, the, uh, the natural encoding that we do is also tailoring these SMT solvers, so we really focus on automatic proof and not so much manual proof like before. And uh, pro the user has uh, some control about the strategy of proof and timeouts, so I won't go into that, but that's at the tool level uh, when you use the proof. Okay, so I have uh, uh, roughly 10 minutes to go over four projects. Uh, good thing is that there aren't that many. Uh, so, uh, Joachim Strandberg was here before. Uh, Ah, <laughs> so if you, are, if you have questions at the end, that's for him. Uh, and he has this uh, quite rich library uh, of uh, things that are useful in digital applications. That is mostly coded in Spark, but it strings, uh, various containers, UTF-8 uh, parsers that were just added uh, 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 yesterday, at least uh, officially, uh, and a few wrappers on ADA code, but uh, wrappers that so that they can be called from Spark code. That's a really typical also uh, thing that we do, implementing many data, but make them available from Spark. Uh, certify is a, a software for, for, for this drone, for this uh, so, a small uh, crazy fly drone that you can buy, uh, open source uh, platform. And uh, Certify is the software that runs on top of it to do the st stabilization. It was coded by uh, my colleague, uh, Anthony Le Moratio. And you replace Priartos on this by Ravenscore, uh, profile of data in time, and the stabilization communication code by Spark, and did absence of a runtime error proof. So there's a cool demo feature where you can uh, uh, let it fall and it lands uh, slowly. Uh, at least we can do it in the small rooms like that. Uh, and it's using prototyping, teaching, research. Uh, so we have a company, Sogilis, of whom uh, we have uh, representatives uh, here. <laughs> who are using uh, uh, CrazyFly for prototyping, and uh, Jérôme Huck from uh, Research Show from Isae, Peru, who uses it in teaching research. Uh, Polyob I, uh, talking about uh, Jérôme Huck, it's him, uh, is developing this uh, high integrity middleware for ADL. So ADL is an uh, architectural description language. Uh, there's a tool to generate ADA codes called Ocarina, but of course, 
all the uh, all these things uh, that are generated, they need to talk through this middleware. And so this middleware was previously in ADA, and now it's been moved to Spark. And it tells a bit of this story uh, in the, in the paper that you will find here that you presented uh, last year at the pharmacy and from. And the cool thing, so he did proof of attacks over timers, uh, proof of some functional contracts over this middleware. And the even coolest thing, cooler thing is that uh, his colleague, he, had, he had a colleague, uh, yes, he had a colleague, Christophe Diarion, and they, they went through this process of uh, uh, developing the, this, uh, these uh, two, uh, or adapting these two middleware from ERA and Z to use on one side Spark and on the other side from a C. So equivalent, equivalent to link for C to uh, prove absence of runtime errors and possibly more. Uh, the cool thing is that uh, he did it much faster, and his colleague at, at some point had to stop because it was too hard. Not to say that it's impossible, but uh, uh, Ada and Spark made it much, much easier to, uh, to achieve. Uh, Pulsar, so still from uh, Sojis, still the same people here. Uh, it's uh, drone autopilot, uh, so there's no, there's not yet a public code repository, but uh, there will be by the end of the year. Uh, it's, it's still ongoing, so uh, uh, right now what they achieve is uh, uh, in the autopilot is uh, manual uh, and stabilized uh, flights, and uh, soon they will have low to flight and then uh, really full autopilot. And it's part of a project to achieve really high level of safety uh, for the drone industry, so the highest level, level A, of the Avionics standard uh, D178. So uh, Spark is one part of the, the process that we put together uh, around agile methods and the formal methods to achieve that at a reasonable cost. And so Spark is used for some pulling some of the functionalities and also absence of functionality. Uh, Strato X Glider uh, by Martin Baker, researcher from uh, Technical University of München. Uh, it's a firmware to control this and mine uh, fixed wing glider model to collect uh, weather data. So it's launched from a balloon and it glides, but uh, how do you get it? Well, you need uh, a kind of autopilot. And uh, they did that uh, over a very uh, small period of time, a few months, and they achieved proof of absence, they target proof of absence of MR and functional contracts. And so you can also uh, see the results uh, uh, in the slides at this, at this location. And what I show here is that these are all the units of code the, uh, in, the, in, this guy, in the software for the glider. All the, the green here has been uh, proof for absence of timers and some functional properties. The gray ones uh, are um, uh, the specs science park, and the black ones uh, are not the part of And so, yeah, it's an uh, ongoing project, uh, but uh, they, all, they all already achieved a lot in a very short time. Uh, Token here, I mentioned it at the beginning, so that was led by uh, Glenet Barnes at Altran, this project. A few months, uh, maybe one year, uh, uh, project to, for the NSA to demonstrate that it was possible to develop very high uh, security software. So EAL5 is the level in the common PTR very, very difficult to get, uh, with formal methods at a reasonable cost. And so the cool thing is that all the project artifacts, statistics on the original code are available uh, from this uh, web page. Uh, and you have a, a version that uh, we have completed the translation to Spark 2014 not long ago, uh, which is part of the, the test suite of, uh, of, Eric, of uh, Spark uh, Pro or Spark Discovery, and which is uh, part of the examples that we distribute with, with the release. Uh, now, Nguyen. Uh, Nguyen is uh, the largest Spark open source project. It's uh, the separation tunnel by Adrian Kenroetzeger and uh, uh, Reto Berki. Uh, so these two are researchers at the University of Rappersville and they work with Securet, which is a security company in Germany. Um, so you look at the website really to know all the, the details of the multiple features that have been added since uh, 2013. It runs on uh, x86-64 and the goal was to have this very, very small uh, code base of 3,000 uh, lines of code in Spark, 300 lines of code in assembly, uh, generally, so it's only grown a bit since then, but it's very, very secure software on which they prove absence of timers. The cool thing is that the latest version, their websites on which they put, uh, they, they put it on Mirage on top of it. So it's really functional, and I mean, uh, on their laptop they use Nguyen. Uh, uh, it's really a functional separation kernel. And to what they say, uh, uh, which is true, is that the uh, Nguyen is really a, a milestone 
uh, in getting this uh, first open source separation diagram that is proved uh, for absence of antimers. And the small one is small that can be uh, modified by others because of uh, its small size and its simplicity. So if you're interested in security, uh, look at this one. Uh, as I said before, the code was originally in the previous Spark, and they managed to uh, migrate it to uh, Spark 2014. Uh, and so now it's, it's moving on with the newest technology. Something interesting is that uh, security uh, is a never-ended uh, uh, battle. Uh, you have to defend against the, the vulnerabilities of tomorrow. And uh, uh, how, to, how best to uh, uh, illustrate the strength that they, they had with their approach then to see how, the, how well they did with the uh, meltdown and inspect code, which were completely unexpected by the worldwide community. And if you uh, look at these uh, uh, mails that were sent on the main dev uh, mailing list, so you learn that meltdown is prevented not necessarily by spawn, but by the, the way that they selected very, very small uh, set of optimizations options to, uh, to do this virtualization. And a spectre is uh, really mitigated uh, and although it could be uh, vulnerable, uh, it's, it's much less than, uh, than if they, they add multiple uh, uh, possible other jumps that they, they do not have defended against. So uh, it's both security is not a software thing. So security is a system thing. And in software, it's not uh, the issue of choosing that or that language, but certainly the choice of simplicity and going for strong uh, warranties like they did uh, accounts for a lot of the results that they get here. So very fast, uh, small community resources. Uh, so there's a community release every year. Next year it will be bundled with NAT. So we have only one on the load. And uh, if you want to get the, the most from uh, Spark, there's a small difference between Spark Discovery and Spark One, the number of provers that are shipped. So we only uh, ship one with, uh, right now, with what we call Spark Discovery. So uh, Spark Discovery is both our pro and uh, community version for, for everyone. Spark Pro is the one that for people uh, who, who pay us. But on, uh, on the community version, uh, in fact, you can install CBC4 and D3 easily. It's documented. So please look at this uh, to get the most of proof. And particularly some of the uh, features that, for example, will only be available if you, if you do that. Now, uh, if you want to learn Spark now, uh, there's plenty of uh, online resources. Edoko University, the five uh, module class. Uh, there's an, another five module class which is not yet on the website. Uh, which is, you can, you can access it from GitHub. And all of these will move to a new Ada and Spark learning website from uh, Edacore this year. Uh, there's a blog, we'll move to Edacore blog this year, and there's plenty of resources that I won't have time to cover, but you will find them uh, from the Spark uh, website. Uh, the great thing is that some people in the community are also producing learning uh, materials, so for example, Zero Mug and uh, Christophe Diarno, they're producing this Spark by example for, uh, for teaching. Uh, Martin Baker has produced a really nice tutorial uh, introducing to Spark. So if you produce anything like that, let us know. We are very happy to advocate it. Uh, there are community events where we try to gather uh, both open source and uh, other community, also professional communities around Spark. So the trans and the researchers, <coughs> Spark and Pharmacy Days. Uh, well, it's Pharmacy and Spark Days, but I, I think I was biased here. Uh, which occurred for the first time in 2017, will occur again this year at the National Institute of Science and Technologies uh, in the US uh, on June 27, 28. So we have great program, great speakers. If by any chance you happen to be there, <laughs> drop. Uh, uh, we have presentations, upcoming presentation at conferences. So Alexander Senier, who happened to have presented his work at the Embedded Mobile and Automotive just before uh, me. So uh, if you want to have a look at what he's doing for security, uh, you can probably uh, watch uh, the video later. We'll present at Bob Conference <coughs> in Berlin, and there will be a presentation at Ada Europe, obviously. Finally, if you want to play with Spark and you're too lazy to download the, uh, uh, the tool, you can play with it at this address right now. That will be also part of the uh, Spark website. There are a few examples, click around, so proof by clicking. Uh, yeah. So what's your first project with Spark? That's my question to you. Maybe we have time for one or two questions. Questions?
So, so the question is, is there a, a not impact at runtime between AI and responsibility?